Now, we've got a really exciting panel who are going to be answering all your questions from the young people here today, and we can make sure the internet is more inclusive and is a welcoming place. I'd like to welcome our panel host, Natasha Devon, and our panelists to the stage. Thank you so much, Myra. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi. hi. Are you still alive, awake? Good. Excellent. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, my name's Natasha, and my job involves going into about three schools a week throughout the UK and increasingly beyond throughout the world. And when I'm in there, I deliver talks, but I also conduct research with 13 to 18-year-olds. And what's really interesting to me, and it's something that Amy highlighted in her speech, actually, is uh, one of the exercises that I do is I show people what I call a stress bucket. And I say, if you imagine that you're carrying around a stress bucket all day, and every time something happens that makes you feel anxious or stressed or angry or sad, you know, a little bit of stress flows into the bucket. And I ask young people to not only tell me what's in their stress bucket, but to quantify it. So what's taking up the most space? And then I repeat that exercise with their parents. I, think, I say, what do you think is in your child's stress bucket? And when you do it with young people, social media and the internet features in the stress bucket, but it's normally quite small. When you ask their parents, it's always the number one thing they say, and it's taking up a lot of room in the stress bucket. So there's this big discrepancy between the way that young people and children see the internet as this positive place where they can form connections and have fun and the way their parents are seeing it. And I think probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. But that's what I'm really interesting, interested in exploring today. And we've got this amazing panel. I was reading their bios earlier. They really are just the best group of people in the world. Um, they're all making a massive difference. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves, um, starting with Natan on the end there and then going along. Hi, good afternoon everybody. My name is Nathan Servi. Um, I work in education. Um, I've been working in education for about 20 years. Um, for the last 10 years, I've uh, managed a project called Streetwise, uh, which runs PSHE um, in Jewish schools, uh, mostly in Jewish schools, in both primary and secondary schools. Um, and so there's a whole range of different programs, including online safety. Just today, we are in full primary schools. Uh, and over the week, we're going to be seeing about 4,500 kids uh, across the country. Um, and I also run another project, which is called Stand Up Education Against Discrimination. Uh, and I'll tell you more about this program a little bit later. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, so uh, I'm Leon, uh, Leon White, and I'm from an organisation called The Mix. Um, so we support anyone who's under 25 and is looking for support, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and I've been sort of working in the charity sector for the last 10 years, mainly around supporting people with mental health and wellbeing. Hi, my name's Grace Mandeville. I'm a YouTuber, presenter, and I've been speaking to quite a lot of you today uh, with Team Own It, which I think you can see the logo over there. So I feel like I know quite a lot of you already. It was really good <laughs> earlier. Thank you for having me. My name is Shay Akiwowo. I first of all identify as a young person. I'm 28. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and I'm also the founder and executive director of Glitch. We're all about ending online abuse and champion digital citizenship. And we are a very small, tiny charity doing our little bit with Safer Internet. Hi, so I'm Francoise Lavade. I'm part of the Girl Guiding Association. So they're the biggest girl-led charity uh, throughout the whole of the UK, about 500,000 members. Um, and so I'm on the advocate panel. So essentially, there are 18 of us in total, and we speak up about really important issues. We go to different media events and really try and champion inclusivity and diversity. So earlier, you were asked to submit your questions to this panel. So we're going to have um, a question time style uh, event now. I'm going to channel Fiona Bruce. How am I doing? Is this good? Good Fiona Bruce. OK. Um, now, this is going to involve me throwing. Um, <laughs> where is Aston? OK. Aston, you have a question for Natan. <coughs> um, what is Streetwise and Stand Up doing? Um, what do you think we can all do to crack down the quarter of 13, 17 year olds that have been targeted in the last month online? Wow, uh, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, no longer identifying as a young person, uh, I have some notes because uh, I thought that that was a really interesting question. Um, so Stand Up is a new project. It started four years ago uh, with lots of support from government and other partners. Um, and Stand Up goes into mainstream secondary schools and delivers workshops on discrimination and focuses specifically on anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim hate. 
And this is both offline and online. Um, and through our streetwise work, uh, we started doing online safety in 2008 uh, in primary schools. And so it's now been 12 years that we deliver online safety campaigns uh, across the Jewish community. So I think we have two sides. We have on one side a minority community. On the other side, we have interfaith work. Um, the statistic that you cite is, is really quite stark and it's quite, uh, it's quite sad as well. I think in the study that we all presented earlier, there's a huge amount of positivi positivity and positive statistics. Knowing that 25% of respondents have experienced online hate over the last month is really quite sad. Um, knowing that 42% uh, have witnessed online hate is even worse, perhaps. Um, and this can be anything. It can be bullying. It can be um, any type of discrimination against, you know, any one of the protected characteristics. There are nine protected characteristics. I can assure you that each one of us in this room is part of one of them, at least one of them. Uh, you could think that I'm a white male. I am also Italian. Uh, I am also Jewish. Uh, and, you know, you can do this with yourselves. Um, and so I think one thing, is, one thing that is really important is teaching about the Equalities Act and protected characteristics. Um, and I wrote down three main points um, about how to respond and how, and how to tackle this. The first one is adults need to listen and learn from young people. And at the same time, young people need to trust their parents, trust their teachers, trust their guardians, trust their educators, and actually perhaps even trust the social media giants that when a report is submitted, that is actually listened to. And parents usually know what to do to support their child, and teachers know as well. The second point is a personal point, and it's about resilience. Resilience means the ability to bounce back. It means that any time that we see a comment that attacks us personally, we need to be able to take it in. We also need to be able to bounce back and respond to it. Uh, we need to be able to learn to recognize what hate crime is. We need to know if it is if it is race-related hate crime, or religion-related hate crime, or a disability-related hate crime. And actually, we need to be able to know where to report it, and what organizations to report it to, and not only the social media giants, but also those organizations that specifically tackle that type of prejudice. And the third point, the third point is possibly the most important. The statistics of 42% are bystanders to hate online, I'm not sure how accurate it is. I could safely tell you that everybody in this room has witnessed hate crime online or offline at some point or another. And actually our message, the message throughout all of our programs is to become upstanders. If you see hate crime, if you see bullying, no matter what age you are, do something about it. And the role of young people in this as the future leaders of our society is it's immaterial. You, 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 you can't put a price on it. Every young person that we teach, we want them to become upstanders. We want them to tackle every type of hate. And we want them to very much inspire us, all the generations, in how to behave online. Thank you. I mean, just picking up on what you were saying there about the difference between a bystander and an upstander, I just want to throw that back to the audience. Put your hand up if you have ever been targeted for an aspect of your identity online. Okay, and for those of you with your hand up, did anything happen during that incident that was helpful? Another person's response or maybe the social media platform that really helped you to resolve it? Okay, that's not great, is it? Um, okay, so what would be helpful? What would you like the other people online to do? Does anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, Aston, do you wanna pass down the microphone? Um, I think, uh, like, if you're getting targeted online, a everyone, even if they don't, like, know you, should help you out, because um, even if it's just one person, it makes you feel better, and it makes you, like, uh, more, like, <coughs> makes you with that, basically. Okay, yeah. so, um, it, saying that it's unacceptable, and, and leaping to your defence, is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and reporting? Yeah, they should report it, they should do, and, like, anything they can to, like, get rid of hate online and stuff like that, but, yeah. Fantastic, thank you. How's your throwing arm? Yes, right. Do you want to chuck that back to me? Yeah. <laughs>
Nice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> OK. Next question is from Steve from Cooper School. Where are you? OK, I'm going to throw. <laughs> hey. <laughs> what inspired you to keep doing what you're doing? And that's for Shay. Um, yeah, so I accidentally set up Glitch um, three years ago. I was a um, elected politician. I was the youngest um, black female councillor to be elected in East London. I stood because I saw a lot of issues in my community. A lot of my friends had been victims or sadly passed away due to youth, serious youth violence and didn't see representation in my local community. So I, started, I decided to stand at the age of 23 and then that afforded me a lot of opportunities to speak about youth representation, to talk about diversity. And one of my speeches that I made went viral and I thought, oh my gosh, this is it. I'm going to get invited to the Ellen Show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get free weave. And, <laughs> and it just elbows finally going to notice me. None of those things happened. I did get two bundles, but it was not enough for a full wig. Um, <laughs> But what did happen was somebody posted on a neo-Nazi website and I was on the receiving end of horrendous abuse for about two to three weeks. And because my address was public at the time as a counsellor, there was a huge concern for my safety. And the response from society around victim blaming, people not knowing how to be active bystanders, we use the word active bystander, but it's the same thing as upstanders. Um, the lack of provision in the law um, and also the response from tech companies just wasn't acceptable. So we were like... Let's do something about it. Let's fix these glitches that are in our internet that's not allowing us to fulfill our fullest potential, that is not allowing everybody to have a positive experience. And the thing that keeps me going is our workshops. So when we go into schools and talk about digital citizenship and you get young people re understanding how they can reclaim the online space, it just gasses me. Um, when, you go, when you talk to women who are like, oh, I don't think I want to get into politics, or I don't know if I want to do public life because you have to be on social media and I'm just really worried about what people say. When we go in there and do our, deliver our training and seeing women say, look, I'm going to go on Twitter now, I know how to kind of set out my digital self-care and make sure that I stay safe, like, that gives me a buzz. And that's what keeps me going, despite all the amount of fundraising I have to do as a charity leader. Um, but that just, that, that's what inspires me. Are you still maintaining that, that distant ambition of being on Ellen and Free Weave? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Idris, let's not forget Idris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. OK, so our next question is Tanisha from Stanburn School. Where are you? OK, Steve, do you reckon you could throw it to Tanisha? OK. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and your question is for Francoise, right? Yeah. OK. Um, I was thinking, if you could add or um, take away anything from the internet um, to help children and young people um, have their say, what would you choose? It's a really good question. It's really had me thinking. Um, I personally really like the social media platforms that allow you to vote on different things in campaigns and really get involved with it, um, especially ones that allow you to do it anonymously. Um, I think it's a really nice way of thinking if your views align with many different people's views. It's a nice idea of thinking about maybe relevant campaigns. And I really like the fact that on relevant social medias, you can repost things to your own friends and onto your own story and ensure that um, e everyone can actually and see what you're involved with and what you're liking to do. Um, but I think potentially a nice thing would be to ensure that it is completely anonymised, because of, often if someone is supporting something that may be slightly more controversial or maybe doesn't adhere to a lot of or a lot of the mainstream views that maybe people in you know, your area might have, um, you could definitely um, be subject to a lot of you know, hate crime and a lot of abuse. And so I think that maybe adding an anonymous aspect to it would be really useful. Um, and also, I think it would be good if you do have a relevant campaign or um, something which you could get involved with. It would be nice to have a short track into you know, exactly how you can be an active member of that particular group or that society and how in which you can maybe invite your friends to, do, to come along with you and do something really like, like that. Really. Mm. I have to tell you, Tanisha, that your question, we, we had a look at all the questions earlier, and your question by far provoked the most discussion in the group, because every time we thought about taking something away, we went, oh, but this part of it is good. And um, Grace, you had some really interesting thoughts about likes and views. Do you want to oh, go on? I spoke about this for way too long, so I'll try <laughs> and make it smaller. Yeah, I said, I think it comes back down to us always wanting to be liked and want to be the popular one. And um, when it comes to online social media, everyone wants to still continue to be liked um, and that we, we kind of need to get that away from us 
Um, we really just want, need to be ourselves um, and be proud of ourselves and not try and be liked by everybody because you'll probably find that you're liked more for who you are than the fake presence that you put out online. Um, and I think that's kind of the conclusion we came to. Mm. But we also all said that we realise it's really, really hard to do. And we probably all try to be liked at some point in our lives. So I think we should just talk about it more because everyone's in the same situation. I think as well there's a challenge there for everyone in the audience because it's about what we're validating, isn't it? I always talk about um, when I, I used to be on Facebook. I'm not anymore because too annoying. But uh, when, I, when I was on Facebook, when I posted to say that I got an MBE in 2015, um, it got a third as many likes as a random picture of me in my kitchen just really dressed up, ready to go to an award ceremony. And um, I've always thought of how I look as being irrelevant. Like my brother says, I'm, I'm quite good at looking nice, but I'm well good at saying stuff. And, and like, <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the point of me, and um, and I so I felt that that was really on them. That was on the, my audience because they weren't liking the right quality. So we can all have a think about that, can't we? And think about what it is that we're validating when we we push that button. Um, the next question is for Grace again. It's Alan from Harris. Where are you, Alan? Um, Tanisha, do you want to throw? <laughs> oh, come that's on. Exactly what I would <laughs> What advice do you have for someone who gets a negative comment online? So I think we spoke a little bit about this earlier, actually, to quite a lot of you that were interviewed for Own It. And there's some really obvious answers, and that is to remove it, to make sure that the per to block the person who's being mean to you, to make sure that you've just got your friends following you on social media. But actually, we were talking earlier, and I, we were saying about actually the most important thing is to actually talk to someone about it. And I was thinking about this, so when I used to get messages, because obviously I put myself on, out online all the time on YouTube, I used to get messages about the fact that I have one hand missing. I know, wild, I bet you didn't notice that one. Um, and actually, I used to think, oh, maybe there's something, wh wh why are people pointing out this difference? Until I spoke to my sister, who has two hands, and I realised, actually, someone else is just pointing something out about her. And then I spoke to my friend, and actually, she had got a hate message, and she doesn't even put herself out online like I do. And actually, if we talk here, we'll probably all find out that everyone in this room has had something mean or something said that's not nice about them. And I think that's why it's important to talk to people and not to think that there's anything wrong with you if you get that. I know it's easier to say that and not to take it to heart, but it really isn't about you, and it says more about that person. And a problem shared is definitely a problem there, so just remember that. Now, Leon, you've been sitting there very quietly <laughs> waiting for your turn to speak. You'll be pleased to know the next question is for you, and it's from Guy from Woodcote School. Where are you, Guy? Excellent. Oh, we're doing passing. Yeah. <laughs> do you think there is enough support for young people online, or do you think there is limited? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think, largely speaking, yeah, I would say there's lots of support that's available. So I mentioned the mix, and that's, that's where I'm from. Um, and some of the things that we do um, is based on what young people have told us is most important to them. So having a space that they can find information that's trusted and that's reliable, um, having a space where they can connect with other young people and for that to feel safe. Um, but also that they can talk about things that are maybe a little bit distressing, and, and that'd be OK too or to just know what their next steps are. And that's kind of what the Mixes model is based on. So if you go onto our website, we've got like 2,000 articles. Um, and it's about any issue you could think of. Um, it's written with young people. It lists services that you could speak to. Um, it also sort of talks about what it's like to experience that particular issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a community space that's available. So you can sign up there. You can speak with other young people. And it can just be about anything, just to have a chat. It can be about, actually, this is what's going on for me, and, and, and I want a space where I can talk about that, and I'd like to hear what your experience was and how you dealt with it. Um, that's all kind of managed by volunteers, so there's also people there sort of keeping that environment safe as well. Um, and then there's a couple of areas that I, I sort of manage. So we have a helpline um, where you can speak to people over the phone um, and just have someone listen to you without necessarily offering any advice, just really hearing what you have to say, exploring that, and then talking to you about what steps are available uh, and what steps you can take next, or a web chat version of that. So you can have message those conversations and, and do it through those kind of media. 
Um, similarly with like a counselling service as well. So if you wanted that kind of emotional support, you really wanted to explore that with someone, you can do that digitally too um, through, through our website and you can sign up automatically to a counsellor. So I think there's lots of support that we offer um, and we, we signpost to more than 16,000 different organisations that support with a range of different issues. But I think the difficulty for young people can be that there's so much choice, where do I start? How do I know what's good for me and what's good for this issue? So um, I think that's one of the things that the mix is, is good at and that I think services generally need to get better at is helping you to decide actually what's right for me. Mm. Um, I also think you know, the mix reaches something like 2.5, nearly 3 million young people, which is great numbers. But actually for under 25s, there's nearly 12 million people uh, out there. So um, there's always more people we can reach and there's always ways that we can do that better. Mm. I think, Leon, you've hit on something really important there. I, I read a study that said um, that if a young person is concerned, they have a concern about something, say it's about their mental health, they're more likely to Google it in the first instance than to talk to a trusted adult. Put your hand up if you agree with that. So here's the thing about Google. Um, <laughs> the internet is obviously a, an amazing resource, uh, but there are millions and billions of people on the internet, at least half of whom are idiots. And what <laughs> happens with Google is whoever's at the top of a Google search is whoever's best at this thing called search engine optimization. So it's whoever has the most money to ensure that they appear first when you Google something. So for example, if you Google my name, the first thing you will see is me having an argument with Piers Morgan. And I can't tell you what a minute part Part of my life and who I am as a person that is it's not an accurate representation of who I am um, so it is really important if you're going to use the internet as a resource that you do so from a, a trusted space the mix uh, is a great place to go and you know that wherever they direct you to you can trust what that organization is going to, to tell you um, but I do want to ask Guy your question so the second part of the question is do you think it's limited what do you mean by that like, um, do you think that, like, yeah, how do I word this? Do you mean, like, if you report, say somebody's sending you nasty messages, if you report it, there's a limited amount that can be done? Is that what you meant? No, I think that there's, like, a, um, a limited amount of people who actually do that. Okay. Okay, so the resource is out there. So do you feel better now knowing what the mix has to offer? Yep. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yep. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so um, we now have uh, some general questions that were sent for, for the whole of the panel. Uh, Joe from Lee Academy, where are you? Okay. I'm sorry. You. How have you used your online identity to help others? Um, so. I am really good at social media, if I do say so myself. So I do really good good morning questions. So how do you guys cut your toast, in squares or triangles? <laughs> Genuine, I ask how do you brush your teeth? And it just gets people talking and using the online space in a, safe, in a really safe and positive way. I'm really good at threads as well. I've done some really good stories. Um, but, the, but I do that all in the framework of digital self-care. I make sure I'm not oversharing. I make sure that I'm not sharing photos or information about people that haven't given permission or consent to do so. And I make sure that when I am sharing stuff, particularly my opinions, I'm doing that in the mind that someone might not receive it the way that I've intended to post it out there. So I'm really careful of like potential backlashes. So I'm unapologetically a black African feminist. And I'm like that on social media, but it also means that I'm a target for those that don't believe in any of those things, right? So I make sure that when I'm posting something out there that um, maybe it could be an article, could be a blog post, could be a response to something. I have the support also of my friends to back me up and be active by centers online. And I also do the same for them. So making sure that we are ready to counteract any kind of um, dogpiling or gaslighting or any kind of things in the mentions. Um, but my online identity is how I've been able to also be a part of different communities. So black Twitter is huge. EastEnders Twitter is really huge as well. <laughs> um, I've connected with people that I probably will never meet in person, but have really shaped my life. And I think that's something that I really want to hold on to and why it's really important to make sure that the online space is safe for everyone to use. I, I think just hitting on something that you said there about when you get dogpiled, um, there's a, an organisation that I work with called the, the Centre for Countering Digital Hate. And what they found is that when you look at all the racism on Twitter, 
it's actually coming from a really small number of accounts. But the way they spread their message is they will target somebody from that ethnic group who they think will reply. And then they've engaged them in conversation. And then, of course, their followers see it. And that's how they're spreading their message. So now, when, when I used to get stuff about being a bisexual or a woman or a feminist or Jewish or what, you know, whatever, I used to quote retweet it and be like, yeah, so is your face. Because it, it used to make me laugh and people <laughs> used to get involved. But now I have stopped doing that because I realize what I'm doing is I'm just giving airtime to that person and potentially helping them to, to spread that message. So it's really important to just not engage I, I think. think there's a balance so I think yeah. we definitely the balance is hard because you never want to victim blame because sometimes doing a quote tweet is getting the support from your followers when you're in real danger mm. and yeah. sometimes you need to talk out as well because if it's a death threat that's not something you want to suppress but equally there is something around the way the algorithms work that you could be amplifying a message and then so that's why it's really important to think about being a digital citizen and what tools you're going to use when you're going through that so you could just sign into a couple of people's dms and say do you mind helping me report this rather than Mm -hmm. quote tweeting it on your timeline but equally sometimes it's really good to be able to show those targeted small numbers of people that you have got a force of amazing people backing you and that when you go for one of them you go for all of us and that's a really nice kind of counter message too so just balancing what can sometimes feel like you have to suffer in silence with actually getting support and some morale as well yeah, and black Twitter is amazing for that. So you target one, and they're like, no, you did not. <laughs> uh, next question is from Zeno at, at Cooper School. Where are you? OK, how are we going to do this? Are you going to throw? <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. Oh! <laughs> so close. <laughs> Why have you chosen to specifically help younger people and not adults? Leon, do you want to take that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think some of that has to do with my own personal story in that when I was younger, that's when I first started experiencing lots of difficulties in my own life. Some to do with my like, mental health, some to do with the things that were going on in my family and the people that I cared for. Um, and that, that kind of really speaks to me. So that being that age and thinking about being that age is really personal. Some of it, I think, is just thinking about what it's like to be a young person. It's the point in your life when you're going to go through the most transitions possibly that anyone will ever go through. You'll go to the new school for the first time, you'll start your first relationship and kind of start exploring that part for the first time. You'll, um, everything will change, you'll just be learning so many new things. Um, and I felt like if there could be something that could support someone at that point in their life when they just needed that little bit of help, that I really wanted to be part of that. Um, and then I think the flip side of it is that like our like, organisation works with so many young people, I think like 80% of us are, are all under, um, under 25. Um, and it's Good just, for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's like such an energising um, group of people to work with. I think working with young people, there's so much energy they bring to things, so much creativity. Um, and it's really nice to be around that because for, for me, who's a little bit older than 25, um, <laughs> uh, it means that I get to be part of that energy too. Fantastic, thank you. Um, now, I'm, I'm aware that we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to be quite selfish, and I'm going to ask... This is the favourite question. It's anonymous, but it's my favourite question that was asked, and I'm going to ask everybody on the panel to try and have a crack at answering this. Um, as young people, we're told to support others online, but we often see adults not doing this. Um, what advice do you have for them? And I assume that they, they mean adults by that. So uh, start with Natan on the end there. That's a tricky question. Um, I, 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 I was going to answer the same question that, that Leon asked, well, answered the minister. Well, ago. you're going to answer. I, I will, I'll get you're to not it. a politician. I'll get to it. <laughs> Well, no, what I was going to say was that we focus on young people, but we also, do, we also try and do as much work as we can with adults. Um, mostly because we think that adults need it mm. a lot more than young people. Um, when I do parent sessions, it, it's all about the fact that young people are born within the internet. Online and offline is the same thing. And for my generation, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, and that's not the same. I got my first smartphone when I was I don't know, 18, maybe. Maybe a little bit later than that. And it was a long time ago. Um, and the reality is that we had to learn a new language. We had to mm. learn a new way of communicating. And so many adults simply see the online medium as, as, as um, 
as a tinted screen, as a, as, a, as a way to be able to say anything they want to anybody else. And then you have keyboard warriors, and then you have people who are really, really nasty online, but then face-to-face, -face, they're very, very British. Uh, and I know because I'm not British, so I know what the difference is. Um, and I think, I forgot the question, but I think... Um, <laughs> what should we be doing to educate adults? Probably learn for young, from young people. Okay. Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, probably just listen to young people and how they are learning digital citizenship and how much we should be learning from them. And put our phones down. Adults, put your phones down. Have family agreements with your children. Mm. Don't have your phone out at dinner time or in the house when your kid just wants to play and have a chat with you. I'll start with that. Leon. <laughs> Um, yeah, I still don't know how to answer this question properly. <laughs> I would say that I think, um, I think some of it is about how we communicate with each other. Um, I think so often some of the difficulties that sort of people that are a little bit older have is about how do I have this conversation with a young person? How do I know what it's like to be on social media in their environment and what that kind of feels like? And they sometimes can have so much anxiety and so many... Um, worries about that, that they sort of project that, I think, sometimes. Whereas if you actually spoke to a young person about what that experience is like, they often say a slightly different thing. Um, and they use it very differently, you know, like an adult using, um, using social media is a very, very different thing. They, they are learning it at a much kind of slower pace. Mm. What about you, Grace? Well, I agree, actually, with what you said about how adults should listen to children and go back and turn it the other way. And actually... That's what you say. If you don't know the answer, you bring it back to yourself and relate it to yourself. Um, and I always bring up the thing that if someone sees I've got a missing limb, and actually quite a lot of you guys have seen it today, children and younger people are happy to ask questions. They're happy to be curious. And I absolutely love that. If you don't know what it is, ask what it is. Mm. Ask me a question. And it's so polite. Like, I'm happy to talk to you about it. You know, we, we're all happy to talk about our differences. The adults and the parents are usually the ones that tell their children, no, don't, don't, don't go over there, no. you'll upset her. No, 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 don't go over there. And for me, that is teaching children that being different is wrong. Being different is something to stand away from. Being different is something to turn your head to. Um, and so, yeah, I genuinely think that kids, you guys are incredible. <laughs> and sometimes we need to learn from you. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question because the assumption when we do our work is that we need to be focusing on young people because it's all the young people's fault with why the internet is bad. I'm like, mm. no, it's so not. <laughs> mm -hmm. And actually, it's an assumption around um, socioeconomic uh, background and behaviours online. And actually, I'll tell you, I've been to some of the poshest schools in this country, and they're the ones that are probably the worstly badly behaved mm -hmm. than um, your inner city London kids. So I think there's a huge kind of stigma around young people that you see offline that just gets tr just transferred online. And I think when you look at adults, though, I think you need to dis 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 di dissect that a little bit because um, women uh, in the adult sector are more likely to experience <laughs> online abuse and harassment than men. And then when you break that down even further, black women are more likely to face harassment and abuse online. So Amnesty International's research showed that black women were, black women were 84 percent more likely than white women to face harassment online. So when we're talking about adults and young people, we need to make sure we have a real intersectional focus and lens when we look at what we mean by those two very large groups of people. So young people are not a cluster. They are, they are made up of very amazing, diverse identities and the same for adults. Um, my biggest tip for adults would be, though, translating how we see civic <coughs> duty and civic leadership offline, online. So the same way that we all think that we should deserve to kind of have clean streets. As a counsellor, my casework was all about poos and <laughs> bins. Um, if we all believe that we are entitled to have a clean street, entitled to have our libraries, our community centres, and that no one should feel like they couldn't walk down Oxford Circus because of catcalling or because of a harassment, those, that same ideology, that same conviction we have about our offline spaces, we should be having online. I think it's just about having more of that dialogue to see the online space. It's not a fictional um, virtual reality, but very much a continuum of our offline spaces. That's why language is really important. We don't yeah. say stuff like the fake world or the online world and the real world. Mm. Like, actually, no, the online world is a very much real and has real impact and real consequences. Yeah. You know, very good question, and I echo everything that everybody said. Um, I suppose the key issue with adults, um, especially in relation to social media, is the fact that they look at social media in a very different way, and it was echoed um, in one of the previous speeches that was made. Um, 
in the sense that they don't really look at it in the same way that we would or I would as a young person who's 20, you know. There's such a fantastic reason behind social media and why it's been created. It's got a fantastic purpose. Ultimately, you're trying to bring different people from different races, religions, ethnicities, all together in one place and really start that conversation. But with adults, they often see it as a place where, you, you know, they can exercise freedom of speech, but to a degree which would go beyond the limits and would actually offend people and it's unnecessary and you know as a parent or you know an adult who may have children or may know young people they should think is it necessary for me to actually say that what purpose does it actually serve is it making somebody happier is it making someone a better version of themselves and if it's a negative comment which it could be you know so for example in our girl guiding survey which um, is an annual survey undertaken every single year you know um 70% of people um, who are from the BAME um, community, they said that they'd experienced abuse and it wasn't necessarily always from other young people. It was actually quite often from older people. Um, and so it just shows that people, maybe who are adults, are not using their platform in the way that they should. And so ultimately, just to go back to the original question, the thing that we need to be saying to parents and adults is that just look back at what you're saying, why you're saying it, and overall, what's the purpose of social media, and why are so many people, millions and millions of people across the country using it? Mm. Um, and so, of course, opening that conversation up and saying, you know, we need to really just, just discuss why. And why. Yeah. I mean, we're all babies, aren't we, really, when it comes to the internet, because it's, it's such a new thing, and we're finding our way. I think, from my point of view, one of, uh, one of my missions is to educate adults about the positive aspects of the internet, because there is moral hyster hysteria about it. I got sent the other day a clip from a newspaper, and it was from something like 1940, and it was talking about comic books. And it, was, it goes back to what Shay was saying, actually, about young people being seen as one homogenous group, mm -hmm. and it was saying, you know, young people are badly behaved, and we think comic books are to blame. <laughs> and, and it's happened with everything. It's happened with the radio, with TV, with yeah. rock and roll, you know, Every new thing that comes yeah. along, it tends to be blamed for the behaviour of that group. And um, there's lots of things. I, I think the organisations involved today are really good at being robust with their research. But the amount of adults that I hear using the terms social media and screen time interchangeably, I'm like, if your kid is on a screen, they could be watching a documentary, they could be reading a novel, you know, they're not necessarily sexting. Calm down. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, I think, I think we do need to, to educate adults as well. Um, so we are now running out of time, but I'm going to go back to the panel and I'm going to go in the opposite direction so starting with you uh, Francoise and I just want you to tell me uh, if there was one thing if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the internet today that would make it a better safer place what what would it be that is a very hard <laughs> question um do not go over what we've already been that's already been said about the removing the like button um I'd probably say if you could maybe try and create some kind of algorithm whereby only positive comments are actually seen by the user, um, because you're not restricting the person from actually saying something negative, um, but you're ensuring that it doesn't go to the person and would affect their mental health or their, or their well-being. Mm -hmm. so okay. If I had a magic wand, I'd want to go back to the root of it, and I'd love that when we are in getting people online, we're improving access and affordability to the internet, we're, we're, we're dovetailing <coughs> that, we're coupling that with online safety. So we're not going, <laughs> I feel like sometimes we're kind of going back on ourselves. So as we're introducing the next generation or the next village or the next town around the world to the internet, there is some kind of online safety there. And going to the root issue as well, I think a lot of these tech companies, my magic wand would be to make them a bit more diverse. I think okay. a lot of these problems we're seeing comes back to the fact that they never really saw this diverse group of people using mm. their platform in the first place. Okay. So you want a time hop? I want a time, I want to go back in time. <laughs> I also want to go back in time before Idris got married. <laughs> uh, Grace, you are queen of everything. What do you do? Uh, I would like to block like <laughs> analytics. Um, and statistics on social media apps from everyone. You know, it's very easy that Instagram and things are saying they're going to take likes <coughs> away from people, but that doesn't mean anything if you have a following on Instagram. You can still check that how many people are viewing your social post. I'm sure that lots of you have Instagram stories and you look at who's seen your story, who's said yes on a poll on your story. And I think it would be really interesting if for a week we all use social media apps, created content for us, and for change and not for who sees it and who interacts with it. And I think that would be interesting, not just for all of us in here, but also companies and people that are higher up in businesses as well. Fantastic. Leon. 
Um, I think it goes back to what I said in the beginning. I'd love to see um, like a tool that exists on a social media site or on anything that you're looking at that says, um, oh, you've noticed this, maybe something unpleasant that you've seen or, or something that um, you're unhappy with. And it, and it helps you to reach out to that person or to offer them support and to say, oh, do you want to speak to someone or do you want some, some support of some kind and, and kind of sends that information through so that, you're, that we are all um, better able to navigate that for ourselves. I'm being very creative here, but I think uh, every time there is a post, there is a reporter, a piece of hate crime or something nasty that is either reported or that somebody sees, that there's an alg algorithm that connects it to a piece of education. It's a simple mm. piece of education that looks at, if it's something anti-Semitic, it talks about the history of anti-Semitism. If it's something that is anti-Muslim or anti-LGBT or anti-disability, actually providing a little piece of education for whomever is either the recipient or the perpetrator of that piece of hate crime. And by the way, there are organisations that do all of this. The only problem is accessing those organisations. Because yeah. we do it, and we do it with thousands of kids every year. And yet, online, the scope and the, the magnitude of it, unfortunately, is probably beyond our, what we can do. That's a really good idea. I love it. Uh, well, thank you so much for all of your contributions. Thank you for the questions, which were fantastic. And now I am going to go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to everyone on the panel there for sharing your ideas and opinions with us. Um, a lot of stuff struck at me. Um, the one thing that struck at me the most was to carry on doing what you love doing despite facing obstacles. It could be your gender, your ethnicity, your age, your sexuality, but to carry on doing what you love doing is really important. Generally, amazing questions asked and really good answers.